Just make sure my hair looks okay. Oh, God, you look great. <laughs> I like your hair. I like that little the, the side buzz. Thanks. That looks good. I did it because um, I was feeling like I've been growing my hair out for like five years. There, it's really long, and then about two years ago, I felt like I needed to cut it. But it's like a vicious cycle where you're like, cut your hair. These are girl problems. You cut your hair, <laughs> and you're like, oh, I wish I had long hair. And then you spend four years growing your hair out, and then you're like, I'm bored of my long hair. I'm going to cut it. It's like a vicious cycle. So then I decided <laughs> just to cut one square out of right, my hair. Yeah. To I'm just going to cut it above me the fix. How about that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, I like it. I think it looks good. Very Brooklyn. Thank you. I did go to the most Brooklyn hair salon I could possibly find. <laughs> Part of Williamsburg, cash only, hundred dollar haircuts. You're like, come on, a hundred dollar haircut? Let me pay with a credit card. Right, exactly. <laughs> this is a coffee shop. But I anyway. might include this into the uh, into the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Please this, do. This is riveting stuff. All right, we'll get. Uh, I guess we'll get started. Today's guest is Jenna Tannenbaum. Jenna Tannenbaum, this is a take two because she was uh, very, very uh, uh, gracious in allowing me to re-record because the first time we did this, it didn't come out great. The sound quality was terrible. It was all my fault, but she is, she was very, very kind and agreed to uh, give it another go. Uh, Jenna is a person I met at a Lululemon group run uh, several years ago now. Uh, she was uh, an amazing person. When I went up to introduce myself, one of the girls standing there said, you don't know who that is? I said, no, who is it? <laughs> They're like, Jenna Tannenbaum. She started Green Blender. Uh, for those that don't know, she is the president and co-founder of Green Blender, along with her then husband and now, I'm sorry, then boyfriend, now husband, Amir Cohen. Uh, they co-founded Green Blender, which for those that don't know, is kind of like uh, Blue Apron for smoothies. So you subscribe to their program and they'll send you fresh organic ingredients so you can throw into a blender and have yourself a nice fresh breakfast or lunch or dinner. Uh, and everything, again, is organic and completely amazing. And in 60 seconds, you have your meal, which my big gripe with Blue Apron, it's cool, it's fun, but it takes forever for somebody like me to make if you don't know what you're doing. Uh, the instructions you have to read like it's a, like a science problem and uh, it just ends up not being the best concoction. But with Green Blender, everything is super easy, super fun, and they always are coming out with new and delicious recipes. So Jenna Tannenbaum, we're happy to have you here. Thanks for having me. This is so fun. <laughs> Again. <laughs> Again. Um, yeah. So I guess we'll get right back into it. Uh, you you started uh, Green Blender back in 2014. What, why? What made you start uh, Green Blender? And what, what what was that process like? Yeah. So I started Green Blender in 2014. And basically, I'm really into health and wellness. I'm just kind of an endurance junkie. I am the first person to try anything. If it sounds crazy, I want to do it. Um, I am just that type of person. And my husband, then boyfriend, is just not that type of person. And so I started making smoothies and kind of giving him my leftovers. And he started really liking it a lot and feeling really good, energized, sleeping better, better skin, thinking more clearly feeling less stressed, kind of everything that happens when you eat more fruits and vegetables. And we all know that we should be eating more fruits and vegetables, but we just don't. So we realized kind of that aha moment was, you know, if you just help people change the environment that they're living in, uh, a lot of amazing things can happen. So that was kind of the seed of Green Blender. And we decided to just give it a shot and try it out. Yeah, I think you're probably helping a lot of people. You know, it's 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 it would seem easy enough to just kind of throw a bunch of things into a blender and blend it up, but uh, some a lot of times it tastes terrible. You know, I think when I when I first started getting when I first started making uh, smoothies for myself, I would just throw in a ton of fruit and then some sort of apple juice or orange juice and create this really sugary concoction, which was really self defeating and ended up probably being a lot worse than it was uh, good for me. Yeah, I was getting in a couple of fruits and veggies, but <laughs> not really. Uh, you really kind of take the guessing game out of it. You're handing people proper recipes. You know, they can, I guess they can add to it and change it, throw in some protein or something if they wanted. Uh, but you're, you're taking that out of the equation. So you're just handing people cause people are busy, you know? Yeah. And I think one of the things that I really love about the company and green blender and our mission is that we're really helping people connect with the food that they're eating again. And I think a lot of times when you start 
down this path of diet and exercise. It comes from a, a place of deprivation and a place of just, um, just, you're not, it's not a place of love basically. And you don't get to actually enjoy the food that you eat and you don't get to feel good about the good decisions you're making. And you, you can't feel, and you kind of feel guilty about bad decisions that you're making like pizza. And what you end up doing is having this really horrible relationship with the food that you're eating or with the workouts that you're doing and really what you're trying to do or what I'm trying to help people do is rebuild that relationship with their health and think about it more like a long-term relationship you have with your husband or wife or your significant other. And you want to start from a place of love and spend time with it and think about it and, and really get feedback from it instead of saying, oh no, I ate pizza last night, so I'm going to deprive myself all week, or I'm going to have to go run six miles or something like that. Yeah. It's, it's kind of a whole, like the health and well-being is, is a, it's a lifestyle choice, you know? And so going, you know, joining that gym or even signing up for green blender, isn't the end all be all. It's not going to be like the silver bullet, you know, it's going to be the, uh, it, it's just a part of that process into becoming a better, stronger you. Totally. Uh, but like you said, you know, so the green, so, so nutrition, right. It has a really, I think people misunderstand nutrition. You know, a lot of times they think I'm going to go on a diet and people think, all right, I'm going to cut back on my calories. You know, I'm going to start exercising more, cutting back on my calories, which is probably the worst thing you can do. Cause now you're, you're burning more calories. You need more energy and you're depriving yourself. Like you said, uh, of, of a lot of the good things that you need in order to complete the workouts. How does, how does green blender fit into that equation? fit into like my, my workout equation? Uh, yeah. I mean, it really goes hand in hand. And I think any endurance athlete or any runner, anyone, uh, knows that, you know, if you're vigilant about how much water you're drinking up leading up to your race, you're going to have a much easier race and you're going to feel really good. It's the same as if you're putting in high quality food and fuel uh, you're going to feel good and burn it well. So it, it really goes hand in hand, even though, you know, I really try to not deprive myself and I really try to um, kind of take life as it comes without feeling guilty or emotionally charged with the food or exercise results that I have. Um, but that being said, I really try to set myself up for success. So I start my day with a healthy choice, like a green blender smoothie, a hard boiled egg or something like that. I make sure that I meal prep as much as I can during the week. And then I have, if I go out to dinner at night, like I'm going to have a glass of wine or a bowl of pasta and not feel bad about it because I know that in the beginning of the day, I've set myself up. And then the more healthy choices you're making, I find the more healthy choices I want to make. And you can see it in your workout routines. You can see it on, you know, when you're pushing yourself hard, you're not dying. You're just, you're feeling that you're working hard, but it's not like, I think there's like a real difference between when you're eating poorly and trying to train hard and when you're eating clean and you're trying to train hard. A hundred percent. I've said this in other, in other podcasts, you know, or in other, in other, in other interviews, the more it's kind of like a trial and error. I look at uh, health and fitness as kind of like an experiment on yourself, right? And so you, a lot of times if you're having like a bad workout, it might have come from you eating poorly the day or two before. And the more you start making those connections, the more you develop like what everyone kind of refers to as this mind-body sort of connection. It really is a mind-body sort of connection. You know, I, mm -hmm. people... I find, uh, will tend to speak about their bodies in like the third person, you are like, Oh, like my knee is acting up, you know, or, mm -hmm. or I, you know, my, my stomach isn't agreeing with me today. It's like, no, it's, it's all part of you. It's all part of that process. You know, like the mind and the yeah. body is all connected. What you put in is what you get out. And I think, uh, nutrition, I think it starts with nutrition. I think that's kind of the backbone of, uh, of a healthy lifestyle. Totally. And it's hard. It's hard for, I mean, I don't know. It's, for runners, for us, I mean, I'm so data obsessed with like my heart rate, what zone I'm in, how fast am I going, you know, all of that stuff. And I'm, I'm tied to my training plan and all these numbers. Sometimes it's good to remind yourself that it's about how you're feeling. 
And all of these things are auxiliary kind of showing you how you're performing. But sometimes it's you have to really make the conscious effort to say, how do like this is supposed to be hard effort or easy effort check in with your body stop looking at your watch like how do you feel and the same goes with food as well eat something how does it make you feel don't think about you know the carbs or the calories or anything like that but make a mental note that when you eat i don't know like a huge bowl of pasta and cheese how does that make you feel versus when you have you know salad and grilled chicken how does that make you feel? So you're starting to make decisions based on how you feel instead of what your mind wants all the time. Right. You know, your your food should give you energy, not take energy away. You know, that, that, that pasta and cheese dish you're going to have, you're going to notice that half hour, hour after you're not going to be super motivated. You know, the likelihood of you going to the gym is (laughs) is going to be a little bit limited. But it tastes um, so good though. It, it does. It does. <laughs> I, I always try to, uh, my, my sh- like strategy, if you can call it, that is I try to get in as much of the good stuff as early as I can. And like you said, it kind of, that will lead you down. Like the, the one good decision leads to another, but at the end of the day, if, if I'm, you know, halfway through my day and I'm like, I'm starving, you know, I, I've had a ton of fruit, a ton of apps, a ton of vegetables, you know, I've done all the right things. I'm still hungry. Maybe what I need is that slice of pizza. Maybe I need that, you know, a little bowl of pasta. I'm not saying overdo it, but as long Ooh. as you're getting the good stuff in, your body will then kind of dictate what you need next. Exactly. So can you speak a little bit about uh, green, like the process of starting Green Blender and what went into that what you know what decisions were made why did you start green blender how hard was it you know what did you learn in the in the beginning totally so amir and i both had careers in technology and startups before we created green blender so we were very much in the sense of a lean startup mentality and we had the idea for green blender and we thought it would be good where you know sending pre-portioned ingredients and superfoods to make smoothies at home will help people improve their health because we believed that smoothies were the gateway drug to healthy living. And so uh, that was the idea and the hypothesis. And before we you know, found a warehouse and had to find a distributor and all of those things, we needed to prove that people actually wanted this. So we created a website, simple landing page that had the value prop on it pre-portioned ingredients and superfoods delivered to your door, make a smoothie in three minutes or less. And we just drove $500 worth of AdWords traffic from Manhattan to the website. And we just wanted to see if people would actually put in their email address and start checking out. And so when we did that, uh, basically people would put in their email address and zip code, and then they would immediately be taken to a page that said, sorry, Green Blender is not in your delivery area green blender doesn't deliver to your area but green blender didn't deliver to any area we were just trying to (laughs) test it out and and see if people were going to try so we found that a lot of people actually tried to sign up and then we finally decided to pull the trigger rip off the band-aid and send them an email to let them know that green blender was now available in their area and so (laughs) just like that we've expanded (laughs) and now we're in your area exactly And so we basically um, started out, two people bought, and then we had to figure out how to actually get those boxes to people. Great. Yeah, that's, that's, uh, I mean, did you find there was like immediate success? Like there was a catching on or did you really have to, uh, was it a struggle kind of getting momentum in, in 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 the beginning? Yes, it was a struggle. It's always a struggle. I equate... I equate entrepreneurship and starting a business like pushing a giant boulder up a mountain. That's how it always feels. Maybe there might be some some like downward motion, but you always are pushing forward this giant problem. You're solving problems that no one has ever solved before. You're fixing things that no one has ever fixed before. And you're trying to run through essentially brick walls with sheer will alone basically. And I think, you know, the problems that we had in the beginning of starting Green Blunder are not the same problems that we have now, but it's always difficult because, you know, as 
the founder of a company or someone that's running the show, um, all of the hard problems come to your desk and none of the easy things come to your desk because they're easily solved. Someone else on your team is going to solve them and they'll save all of the very difficult strategic partnership goals kind of to you. Yeah. Which at the end of the day, you can't out put everyone down, <laughs> we'll say that again? Very, not to put everyone down or be a downer about, uh, the glamorous life of running a company, but <laughs> it, it really, I mean, it's the same kind of coming back to training for a marathon or looking at a professional athlete. You're only seeing them run that race and win it. You're not seeing, you know, the, tons of days that they woke up at 5 a.m. and had a shitty workout and didn't hit their goals and felt bad and had lots of self-doubt and any of that it's all part of this game and and you are always working hard even when you're <laughs> running the marathon and and training or and uh competing at your event um you're pushing and it's not easy. And if it was easy, then everyone would win. <laughs> That's right. That's I say that all the time about uh, about just running and endurance sports. If it was easy, everyone would do it. Exactly. What would you, looking back now, what would you do differently? Hmm, that's a good question. I'd probably delegate more faster. <laughs> I am very hard. I'm very, it's very difficult for me to delegate tasks and get things off my plate. I'm like one of the people that are just like, okay, I'll just do it. I'll just do it. I'll just do it. And then you run out of time and then you don't have enough time to find people to do the things that you need to be, that need to happen. And then you kind of like dig yourself into this horrible hole that you can't get out of because you have no time to find people to help you get out of it. Um, so I, that's something that I think about a lot and how to get uh, tasks off my plate and really be clear on to myself that, you know, is this something that really needs to be done by me or can I get somebody else to do it? Because it kind of goes back to answering like the lean startup mentality and trying to help, you know, trying to get out of your comfort zone all the time. Um, some of the problems that I feel like I should own are not really problems that I need to own because they're just, they're already solved and I could teach somebody else to solve them and, and get off my plate. But because I have the time to, you know, work on that problem and, um, work on the problem, I'm kind of like in a comfort zone because I know how to fix it versus getting off my plate and finding another problem. I don't know how to fix and dealing with that. I don't know if I said that clearly, but that's how it is. <laughs> no, it was, it was good. The, you know, being an entrepreneur, I think you, especially in the beginning, you have to be an expert at everything, right? Like you don't have the funds, you don't have the, the structure, you don't have the, uh, just the capabilities of really delegating anything. It was just, it was just you and your, 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 again, your then boyfriend, now husband at the time, you know, I'm sure you split up the, uh, responsibilities as best you could, but you have to be an expert at everything. And then to, you know, I think it's a hard transition to make to then give up that control, give up that power. And, and, and again, like you said, time, like you then have to teach somebody else how to do the things that you've been doing. You know, some of those tasks might be more difficult than others, but, uh, it's, it's, there's a big, there's a big, I don't know, the big hurdle that I think a lot of people don't make in terms of that, yeah. that delegation. How, how did totally. you find the people that you put in those spots? I mean, through, your, through our networks and word of mouth and job boards and going to events. I think as an entrepreneur, one of the things that I've learned uh, is that you should always be hiring. Uh, even if you don't have an open position, you should be networking and meeting people and talking to everyone because when that job opportunity opens up, um, you'll have people that you already know and trust to be able to tap into those positions. That's good advice. What do you, so the people that you've hired, are, are they all into health and nutrition also? Is that, is that, do you, do you want them to be, or do they, do they not necessarily have to be? You just want them to be able to do the job. I mean, you don't have to be, but I think a lot of times, uh, it really does help kind of create that passion in the company. I mean, I want everybody to live their passion and help people and do whatever they need to do to make themselves feel fulfilled. And I think that really does come off in the interview process and 
people are attracted to Green Blender because of that bigger mission. The bigger we get, the more successful we get, the more money we make, all of that just translates into more people eating fruits and vegetables, which is very cool. Especially I had a, my, my background is in technology and, and one company we were selling um, impressions and, and we actually made up our own kind of impression metric. And so you end up, you end up losing touch with what is real and, and all of the stuff that you're working on. So, um, yeah, I think, I think people are naturally, or they naturally gravitate towards that and they feel like they're working on something bigger than themselves and it's more than just a paycheck. All right. I'll keep that in mind when I'm, when, <laughs> when personal records that expand is expanding, I'm going to keep that in mind. I'm going to re-listen to this whole podcast and, <laughs> and start taking more notes. Uh, what, what is your, what is your athletic background? Well, I mean, I've always been athletically inclined, but my endurance history only goes back to 2012. So in high school, I guess it is endurance. I was on a crew team. I rode on a crew team. That's definitely and that's, 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 Yeah, that's I guess you're school. right. I'm just like looking back on that. So. But my – so I guess in high school I rode and I, I rode horses too. And in college I ended up getting really into CrossFit. Here I go, like I'm really into these extreme things. And CrossFit is kind of the epitome of extreme – fitness. <laughs> have you done an 18.1 yet? I have, st I'm like retired, <laughs> a retired CrossFitter. Now I am a runner, <laughs> but I got into CrossFit really into it. Hardcore. Um, and work, I did that maybe for four or five years. And then I kind of, you know, something shifted where I felt a like, little bit burned out by the culture of CrossFit, which is, you know, you have to do go hard. You have to puke after every workout or else you're not working out hard enough. You have to eat paleo or else you're not, your diet isn't correct. And this kind of elitist feeling, I got burned out on that. And I felt like, you know, fitness is, it doesn't matter what thing you're doing as long as you're moving your body and you're enjoying it. And I think we get into these like pigeonhole spots where, you know, I don't really like to lift weights. Okay, fine. Like go find something else. Go rock climbing because you're lifting your body and that's the same, whatever, like do what you need to do. You need to find your joy in moving your body. And so I started kind of exploring that. I started a fitness blog and tried a bunch of different uh, fitness classes all over the city uh, for like maybe six months. And during that time, somebody gave me um, I got an entry to the Brooklyn half marathon and, or someone in my office, we were all decided to do the Brooklyn half marathon. And I'm just got peer pressured into it. And before the Brooklyn half marathon in 2012, um, I had never run more than three miles in a row. I like hated running. I thought it was boring. I couldn't imagine ever doing something like that, but I decided it was a challenge. I was going to do it. So, um, that was kind of the start of my endurance my endurance fever, I guess I would call it. Uh, and it really opened my eyes to, you know, the amazing community, the running community in New York, but in the running community in general, it's just like very open. Everyone's serious about, you know, beating their best time or their personal record <laughs> and not, um, and not really like comparing yourself to somebody else. Like everyone is, you're not like going out to the Brooklyn half and trying to win it. You're going out and trying to win, like beat the time you did last year. And so I think it's like the camaraderie and the vibe of running was really refreshing to me. And I think that's really what got me into running to start. Uh, okay. Yeah. The running community is just a, it's just an awesome one. You know, it, like you said, it's, it's, there are varying degrees of, um, of, uh, of competitiveness. You know, if you want to be, you, you can get, you can, it's, it's like entrepreneurship. You get out what you put in. If you want to be competitive, you can be, if you want to just be competitive with yourself, you can be, uh, and just like it's, it has, it, it's kind of the best of all worlds. Yeah. And if you're, com if you're a competitive type, you compete with, you know, you could compete with your teammates, but you're not going to like diss anyone who doesn't want to compete. I don't know. It's just, this kind of like an, 
you can be a competitor, but also, and also be very open and let everyone do what they want to do, which I really like. Yeah. Again, like the, the, those Lululemon runs that we did, uh, it was, it was such a, it was a, a good eclectic group of people. Uh, there were like potlucks at the end of it. People would bring in food and there would be picnics at the end, you know, uh, Emily would teach yoga classes at the end of them. And it was just such a fun, cool way to spend a morning. You know, one of the reasons why I got into it was because I was tired of spending Friday nights doing Friday night type of activities, you know, so my Friday nights became my Saturday mornings just mm-hmm. to get, you know, I'd get together with my group of guys and go out riding bikes or I'd do the morning runs like at Lululemon or wherever. Uh, and it just was such a, such a, it was such a better quality way, uh, just to spend time, you know, going yeah. out to bars and restaurants is fun and all. I just kind of, I was kind of tired of it. Yeah. Especially in New York. It's like such a, I have such a hard time hanging out with friends that don't, that it don't, that doesn't involve drinking or eating. And that's what I really like about running is you can, you know, just run at a conversational pace and then you get to hang out with somebody for an hour or two and chat, which is fun. And you're working out at the same time and seeing the city. Yeah. And not feel hung over the next day, not affect your job performance the next day. (laughs) And I think there's a little bit, there's a little bit too much of that, 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 that goes on. Yeah. Not to judge, you know, I've been there, I've done it. <laughs> uh, so what, what do you have planned next for Green Blender? Where, where do you see this going? I mean, our mission is just to help people improve their health and make their health more of a priority in their life that doesn't take over their whole life. So, you know, smoothies, like I said before, we dub them the gateway drug to healthy living. And so we want to start offering other solutions and opportunities to engage with the food that they eat, you know, on an ongoing basis. We see some of our customers say, you know, every week when I get a green blender box, it just feels like Christmas. I'm opening the box and it's like a present to myself. And that is amazing. Like you're opening a box of fresh produce. You get really excited and engaged with it. That's how, that's how every meal should be. You should really connect with the food that you eat understand, you know, what a kumquat is or see how an apple is grown. We are get so disconnected with the food cycle and the food system and how, you know, I remember I made a a vegetable garden in Brooklyn. Bad idea. I spent like five hundred dollars on one <laughs> salad. But <laughs> Uh, but I grew baby spinach and they were like little baby leaves just like out of the ground. And I was just shocked. And even though, and then at the same time, I'm like, oh yeah, that's how spinach grows out of the ground like that. But because you just don't see it in its environment, you don't feel that connection to it or, or think about how much time and energy it takes to grow one strawberry. Uh, and then I think it really elevates the, the whole experience of eating instead of just shoving something down your throat that is easy and convenient. Yeah, there's a huge food disconnect. Uh, I'm I'm as guilty of this as anyone. Like I grew up in New York City. I've spent very little, if any, time on a farm, and to see the amount of work that goes into growing something, or see the amount of uh, cultivation necessary, you know, see what it takes to get to your supermarket. It's just such a big disconnect, and I, I think people have kind of lost touch with that, mm-hmm. which is unfortunate. So yesterday was National Women's Day, and on Instagram you had a really great post. <laughs> about helping people and how, and, you know, and mentoring you gave, you gave, I think it was three points of advice on, uh, on what you can do to support women, to get more women in the, uh, kind of the corporate world or like the, the CEO corporate world, you know, like the kind of high level, uh, can you speak a little bit about one, your recommendations and two, what it's like being, uh, like a woman in not only a tech company, but just at the head of that tech company? Yeah. I mean, I'm always about action. I'm an action oriented person. So, uh, hopefully I didn't get too preachy, but really, I mean, women we're, we've come a long way, but we have a lot to go. And I think there's a couple things that we all can do to promote women and help them succeed, um, men and women. So one thing that I love to recommend anyone do is pick two people and mentor them. And you don't have to mentor the whole world, but who are two people in your life that, you know, are really rising stars, rock stars, they are super smart and dedicated, 
and spend a little extra time with them. Take them under your wing. I think we're always looking for mentors, especially women. I just hear that a lot. Like, how do you find a mentor? How do you find a mentor? And we forget that we ourselves can mentor people. You're never going to feel like you're the expert or on top of the world. Or There's always something more to learn, but you have had some experience. And maybe your first year out of college and you can mentor someone who's you know, a senior in college and talk to them about how to find a job out of school. Or maybe you, you know, like for me, I've started a company. I feel like I still don't know anything, but I do know what it feels like to start a company in day one or two. So find somebody that's in those shoes and really help them, you know, stay accountable. So that's number one is just being a mentor, helping people. I think there's a a lack of mentorship in, in women in business. And, um, because, I mean, a few things, but there's just not a lot of women in leadership roles, but I think everyone could be in a leadership role depending on how you look at it. Um, So that's number one. (laughs) Number two, (laughs) not to like really get preachy, uh, but I think uh, (laughs) think you have a lot of good advice to give. Let's hear it. This This is why you're on the podcast. We want to hear what you have to say. Um, the second thing I think anyone can do is support the ideas of women and champion them. So if you like an idea that somebody said, say, I really like that idea, and then say, oh, you know, Brittany had this great idea that we should do X, Y, Z, bring it up, champion them, help them out, uh, and they'll help you out. So I think, you know, supporting the ideas of women and understanding and championing those are really important as well. Um, the next thing you can do is call people out on their unbiased, unbiased, uh, consciousness and behavior. So (coughs) I think there's, um, I don't think that everyone is sexist, but I think there's unbiased or unconscious bias where, um, that might be getting in your way. And so if you're in a position to, you know, take a guy friend aside and say, you know, you can, you could probably stop calling that a 40 year old CEO, that girl, you could say that woman instead, uh, that would be helpful. So being able to identify where you can actually be heard, taking people aside, you don't have to publicly shame people, but like some people are just not aware of the power of language and just shifting a few things could make a big difference. So what advice would you have to really, I guess a man or a woman at this point, if they're looking to start their own uh, enterprise, what what advice would you give for somebody just trying to get started? Yeah, I think um, you should just get started. (laughs) Very easy. All right. Um, uh, You heard it here. That's that's really good advice. I, I mean, you hear a lot of, here's the one advice that I really like to give is solve for the problems at hand and not your future problems. Because if you really want to start a business, what's the what's the really the main problem that you're trying to solve? Maybe the first problem you're trying to solve is, do people actually want to buy my product or buy my idea? And so you need to come up with an, a way to test that before you think about how you're going to you know ship a million units. And I think people procrastinate by trying to solve these future problems. Uh, instead of the problems at hand, because it makes you feel very vulnerable when you're like, hey, here's an idea that I really believe in. And you put it out into the world and everyone's like, that's stupid. Not everyone, but people will say that and it's hurt, it hurts your feelings. And so people don't want to feel There's a lot of naysayers that. out there. It is. It's true. And And as an entrepreneur, you are very vulnerable because you are saying, here's an idea that I'm willing to spend you know, in the next five, 10 years or my entire life on, what do you think? And then the internet just takes over and (laughs) and people are very mean. Uh, But you just have to just get through that and do it and believe in what you're doing and start. Yeah. Yeah. That's really good. Yeah. There's a lot of people. What's that? It's easy and as hard as that. (laughs) Exactly. Yeah. Taking that first step. It's, it's a, it's a hard, it's an easy step to make. But it's also pretty, pretty hard, you know, just yeah. kind of mentally. I mean, you have I mean, to be, you yeah. have to be a risk taker. You have to be willing to kind of put it all out there, whether it's financially 
or uh, or just kind of like your reputation, putting that on the line. You know, there, yeah. there's a there's a lot you're gambling with, and it's very scary for a lot of people. Which again is one of the reasons why I wanted you on the podcast because you are a risk taker. You you put your money where your mouth is. You didn't you know you kind of put your toe in the water, I guess, at first. But you decided it when you decided to take it. You you dove in head first. Yes, I'm very action oriented, but I think everyone should be and can be. It's just. Um, And I think runners in general are action oriented. It's not like we're like lying around being like, Oh, I really want to get like a sub three and a half, three and a half hour marathon. It's like, you're like, I'm going to get this. Here's the training plan that I'm going to do. And I'm going to start it now. Um, I think entrepreneurship is very much the same. And it's such a cliche to say it's not a sprint, but it's a marathon, but it's true. It's like the life, (laughs) It's like every piece, every decision you make, the same as every workout you do, one workout or one decision is not going to make or break you, but it's the culmination of all of those things. And it's having the big picture goal uh, to reach that, that end result is what's going to make you feel successful. But I'm going to say being an entrepreneur and running a marathon are very much the same where like, as soon as you reach that finish line, you're like, okay, I'm ready for a new marathon and a new time. Like you want to hit another goal and you don't feel satisfied until you reach that new goal, but immediately you want to do another goal. So it's the same with entrepreneurship. There's no, like that you, you're never going to feel like you've made it. You're always going to move the bar further away. What do you think that is? Where do you think that impetus comes from? Because I think you're right. I think there's a lot of correlations between endurance athletes and entrepreneurs. Because like you said, there's a lot of uh, a lot of the things that make you a good endurance athlete will make you a good entrepreneur. And one of those things is that impetus, like nothing is ever good enough. What What is that? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think us endurance athletes are also very good at repetitive, boring work. <laughs> <laughs> and that is like a big chunk of success. You just have to get things done. And it's not always glamorous and you just have to put in your long run and like listen to your audio book and just bang out two hours. You know, it's just like, that's how it is. <laughs> I, you know, it's funny. I worked on a, a political campaign back in 2008 and it was, it was like that. It was just, I mean, sometimes you're just stuffing envelopes. That's like your day. Right. And just, it can be very, very, very mind numbing, very, very monotonous, but then come election day or come these different milestones, these big speeches or whatever, it's super, super exciting. And that's yeah. kind of how I always looked at endurance sports. And that, that's something I've always kind of, uh, you know, in, in making decisions about, uh, what I'm going to do with my life. I look at that, you know, like a podcast, let's say it's a lot of work, a lot of, it's a, you're grinding out a lot of work to get that episode released. But when you do, it's so exciting to see what's going to happen. Are people going to like it? Are they going to respond to it? You know, it's, it's a fun, it's a fun little, uh, I don't know. It's just the thing that I've always responded to. Yeah. All right. I guess we agree on that. <laughs> <laughs> um, what's, what's next? Do you have any races this year? What's, uh, what's next for Jenna? Yeah, I'm running the Shape Women's Half Marathon in April. Um, I'm not sure. I really my my half marathon PR is one hour and forty four minutes. I'm not sure I'm going to be able to hit that just because I was I got like sick for a month, <laughs> and so that's kind of screwed with my training plan. But my big goal this year is running the New York City Marathon. And I really want to be Q, but I haven't yet like really dived in and and made that my goal, but I would like to do that. (laughs) You definitely have some time for that. You have all summer long. We'll see. I I think you'll get there. It's scary. It's scary to put a big goal down, but maybe, maybe I'll just make it now on the podcast. I had this conversation (laughs) today. You know, do you think it's better to say what you want? Like, like, if you have a big goal, is it, do you think it's good to tell everyone, like, like shout it out to the world, this is what I want to achieve? Or do you think it's good to kind of keep it, you know, inside and say, you know, not, not put that pressure on you? I think it's better to put the pressure on. I mean, it depends on how you, re- how you respond to pressure. But if I tell people, like, if I tell people that I'm going to hit something or I'm like talking about it for months, then when you're in the pain cave and you're like, uh, I either push through this so I can freaking post to Instagram that I did it and everyone's going <laughs> to high five me or I'm going to have to like tell people that um, tell people that I didn't do it. I don't know that that peer pressure is like what I dr- mm. like thrive on. So it just depends on how you thrive. 
Yeah, I, I usually try to keep it internal. I, I you know, I, I had a guy one time say like, you know, what are you trying to do for this marathon this year? And I was like, oh, I'm not saying it. He's like, no, you got to tell everyone it doesn't, you know, the, like put the pressure on you. I was like, no, I'm not going to say it. <laughs> it seems to be serving you well. You're a very fast runner. Well, stop it, stop it. <laughs> maybe not. Who knows? Maybe, maybe if I put the pressure on, maybe, I, maybe I'd be a little better. Who knows? It's true. It's true. You never know. That's why I like doing reach goals. Having like a really put it, put a number down there that is like scary. Make that your reach goal because if you're always living in your comfort zone, then you're never going to surprise yourself. Yeah. Even, even, yeah, I guess, I guess I, I agree with that hundred percent, you know, give yourself, you know, an A goal of something that you really don't might be, you're not sure if it's possible, kind of, kind of like in the middle of a race, a good, a good quote I've always heard is, uh, you know, if you think the effort is if you think the effort is too hard, then you got to back it off. You know, if you think, if you think you're working too hard, you have to back it off. If you think you can maintain that effort forever, then you have to kind of pick it up. The answer, the answer you're looking for, like when you're saying like, am I running too hard is maybe, you know, like you, you want that, you want to be, you want to live in that kind of maybe zone during a race where like, I'm not sure if I can, if I can maintain this effort. And I think that that a goal should be kind of the same, you know, can I reach this goal? If the answer is yes, then that's not a hard enough goal for you. You know, the answer exactly. should be, or if the, you know, it's similarly, if the, if the, if the A goal is like, no, I can't, you know, the, I want to win the Olympic gold medal. Like I'm not, I'm not going to do that. That's, that's too, that's too far. But yeah. if I want to do X, Y, Z time, if the answer is maybe, then maybe that's a good goal for you. Yeah. And I think the same is true for entrepreneurship and everything else. Yeah. You got to get a little scared with your dreams. Yeah. Otherwise it's not a dream. Yeah. Then it's just a nightmare. If you're, it's, it's, it's kind of funny. Like if you're not at all scared of your dreams, maybe it's a nightmare. Yeah. I like that. Little, I'm going to use that one. Maybe I might, in, I might make in a little, the future little... when you're like, oh, I should have tried harder. Like yeah. you never want to have that regret. And I think that's in life and in races. You never want to like reach that vision line and be like, oh, I should have pushed harder. Like, you is... want to be like, I pushed as hard as I freaking could. And this is what I got. That is the scariest. That is the thing I'm most scared of in the world, just on, on, on a macro and micro level. Like the micro level, like think about a race. If I cross that finish line and I, and I know that either during that race, I could have pushed harder or in the months leading up to that race, I could have done more workouts. You know, maybe I kind of nixed a few too many. It's such a devastating blow to me. I just get really upset when that happens, you know, it, mm -hmm. I don't fall into a depression or anything, but I just get, I get really bummed out when I think I've let myself down and same thing on a, like a macro level. If I think I've kind of let myself down just in life, if I, mm -hmm. if I, if I didn't work hard enough, like this podcast, if I don't think I'm working hard enough on this podcast and it's going to be really, it's going to bum me out when the episode's released and it's not as good as it could have been, or, or, you know, I'm not, it's, it's, it just didn't get as many downloads as it could have. It's just, I find that I just get a little, I get bummed out by yeah. it. And I mean, not to like belabor this whole point, but when you have really big dreams and goals in life and in running, I think you get creative on how to achieve them. You, if you have a really big, big goal, like if you wanted to like triple the number of listeners in two months, like how would you do that? And I think instead of like, let me steadily grow 5% every week, instead you have to really swing big. And you might miss, but you might not. And then you just freaking achieved greatness. Yeah. And if you miss, you just, you figure out the next big swing, you know? Exactly. That's good. All right. I think I'm better for having had this conversation. <laughs> good. You're going to see Me some too. big things coming from, coming from the personal <laughs> record podcast over the next few months. And it's all good. thanks to this conversation. <laughs> uh, all right. I think that's kind of it. I think that's a good, that's a good way to end it. Uh, awesome. Jenna, thank you very much for joining us on personal record. Thank you very much for joining us again on personal record. <laughs> uh, again, you've been very, very uh, patient and gracious with your time. And I really, really appreciate it. Uh, for everyone out there, please subscribe to green blender. They do amazing things. If you're look, if you're, if you're a smoothie person already, it's going to make your life a lot easier. You're going to have a lot more flavors to choose from. And if you're not a smoothie person, it's going to teach you how to do it. It's going to give you some ideas and it's going to inspire you to be better than you were the day before for. Uh, so Jenna, thank you very, very much. And, uh, I hope to have you on again sometime. Thank you for having me. Yeah. This has been a really good conversation. Uh, we're going to have links in the show notes to, to Jenna, to green blender, to everything else that, uh, Jenna is looking to promote. Do you want to give any, any shout outs right now? Uh, yeah, you can follow our Instagram, just Google or Instagram green blender. It's green underscore blender. And if you like following runners, you can follow me, Jenna Tannenbaum. She does a uh, daily, um, 
uh, recipes. So if you go to greenblender.com, I think there's a, a video every day of uh, Jenna giving you a new recipe and how to make it and what to do and some sort That's of right. delicious treat. <laughs> I'm kind of obsessed. <laughs>